Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in the last lecture we had the talk over the topic of rule of law. Under that topic of rule of law, we discussed the different aspects of rule of law and the rule of law in Indian constitution. The relevance of rule of law was also discussed under that topic. Today in the present presentation, we will have the talk over the topic of doctrine of separation of powers. Under this topic of the doctrine of separation of powers, we will discuss the different aspects of the doctrine of separation of powers, the relevance behind this doctrine of separation of powers, the evolution, the growth and development of doctrine of separation of powers, the status of this doctrine in US in UK and the doctrine of separation of powers in India. Why the doctrine of separation of powers cannot be applied in its classical or strict sense, we will also discuss on this issue. So, the doctrine of separation of powers as we all know, it is an animation of rule of law. It is essential for achieving the objectives of the rule of law without separating the powers of different three organs of the government. We cannot check the arbitrariness in the governmental functioning. We cannot provide for such a regime where the government officials are not allowed to take the actions in accordance with their own wishes or whims or and they are responsible to respect the basic liberties, thoughts, the, the rights and the freedoms of the individuals. Therefore, this doctrine of separation of powers, it the most relevant aspect of the constitutionalism. Under the constitutionalism, we know that the efforts are made to make the government with limited powers. This is the principle of the limited government or this is the principle of the limitations over the government and the separation of powers is an important factor, an important element which is to promote the constitutionalism in any constitution. If we talk about the evolution and growth or the historical perspective of the doctrine of separation of powers, it seems that it has very ancient origin. John Locke in his work, Two Treaties of Government, published in 1690, divided the powers of state into three. The division of powers of the state is very important for separating them in different three institutions, in different three organs of the state. John Locke divided all the powers of a state into three, the legislative powers, the executive powers and the federative powers. This division of John Locke of all the powers and functions of a state into three, the legislative, the executive and federative, it depends on the nature of the powers and functions being exercised by the state, by the government. By legislative powers, Locke meant the general rule making power and he designated this legislative power of the state as discontinuous legislative powers. The legislative powers are always exercised with some intervals. These are not exercised continuously. Legislature functions at certain intervals 
and they never exercises their powers continuously and therefore, he designated the legislative powers of the state as discontinuous legislative powers. It is also the fact that the executive powers of the state are exercised continuously day and night 24 by 7 the exercise of executive powers is made by the government and therefore, Locke termed these executive powers as continuous executive powers. Federative powers was the third category of the powers of the state in accordance with the Locke's classification. By the federative powers, Locke meant the powers or the functions being exercised by the state with regard to the foreign policy, with regard to the foreign affairs. Locke separates the powers and not the institutions. So, the structural classification or structural division was not made by Locke in his division, in his classification of the functions and powers of the state. He was of the view that one institution may exercise two kinds of the powers, but the powers of the state should be separated, should be decided. Under the executive powers of the lock, both the executive powers and the judicial powers were included. So, the same institution, the executive, was exercising two kinds of powers the executive powers and the judicial powers, and therefore, we can say that lock divides the powers and functions of the state, lock does not separate the institutions. He was of the view that legislative power is superior than the executive powers than all two other powers. The reason which he quoted for the supremacy of the legislative powers was that legislative powers derives their recognition and authority directly from the people. Legislators, they are the elected representative of the people. They are the representative of the common people of the state or the country and therefore, the legislative power always takes its recognition from the people directly and this is the reason for the supremacy of the legislative powers over all other two kinds of powers of the state. After Locke, the great French philosopher Montesquieu, he presented the scheme of the separation of powers and the modern doctrine of separation of powers, which we study under the administrative law. That was the effort of Montesquieu that the doctrine of separation of powers could be designed in such a way. So, he the all the powers of the state into three, the legislative powers, executive powers and the judicial powers. It is also believed that Montesquieu divided all the powers of the state into two, the general legislative powers and the general executive powers. Under general executive powers, Locke included two kinds of powers, the executive powers and the powers in the form of the federative powers of Locke. Locke's firstly divide all the powers and functions into two, the general legislative powers, general executive powers and then he divides the executive powers into two. Number one, the executive powers and the federative powers are the powers of the government, the functions of the government in the form of federative powers of law. Then he further divides the executive powers into two, the civil law executive powers and the judicial powers. So, this is the division, but generally we know that Montesquieu divides all the powers and functions into three, the legislative powers, the executive powers and judicial powers. It is also important to note that Montesquieu emphasized over 
the mutual exclusiveness of three organs of the government. He was of the belief that one organ must exercise only one kind of powers. There shall not be any kind of accumulation, there shall not be any kind of concentration of powers only in one organ or only in one institution. He was of the opinion that concentration of powers and the accumulation of functions will create a hazard to the personal freedom of the people. Certainly, if the powers are accumulated, if the powers are combined or all the powers are wasted in one institution, all the powers are wasted in one organ of the state, it will be hazard for the freedom of the individuals, for the rights of individuals, for the liberties of the individuals. Reason being, Montesquieu also made the statement, he also clarified that why the accumulation of powers and the concentration of powers would become the hazard for the freedom, liberty and rights of the people. He says that if the legislative powers are combined with the executive powers, then only one institution is responsible for both enacting the laws and to apply those laws or to enforce those laws. And in this situation, the same institution will enact the tyrannical laws and it will enforce those laws in tyrannical manner. If the executive powers and the judicial powers are combined, then again the same institution will enforce the laws and if there is any challenge to the, the, the process of the enforcement, the same institution will give the clean chit to the enforcement of the laws by the executive. So, when the same person or same institution is responsible for both the execution of the laws and the interpretation of laws or to see the procedures by which or to examine or investigate or review the procedures by which those laws are enforced, then certainly there would be the arbitrariness in the manner in which the laws are implemented or enforced and the laws are interpreted. Again, if you see that if the legislative powers are combined with the judicial powers, then the same institution, the same person is responsible for both the enactment of laws and the interpretation of laws. In this situation also, the same institution will enact the discriminatory unreasonable laws in arbitrary manner and the interpretation when the circumstance of interpretation comes, the same institution will interpret those laws in accordance with its own basis. And therefore, certainly there would be the arbitrariness in enacting the laws the arbitrariness in implementing or enforcing the laws and the arbitrariness in interpreting the laws. So, all the powers the legislative, executive and judicial should not be concentrated, should not be accumulated to only one organ of the state, to only one institution or even to only one person. Otherwise, it will be violative of the basic concept of equality, it would be violative of the rights, liberties and freedoms of the people. This was the logic of Montesquieu behind this doctrine of separation of powers and therefore, he firmly believed that there shall be the distribution, there shall be the division, there shall be the classification of all the powers and functions of a state and one organ should perform only one kind of functions, one organ should exercise only one kind of powers. What does this doctrine of separation of powers means? What does this doctrine of separation of powers signify? Wade and Phillips also worked on it and they suggested three postulates. 
he suggested three meanings they suggested three propositions to understand the doctrine of separation of powers according to wade and phillips the separation of powers means number one the same person should not be the part of more than one organs of the state when wade and phillips they say that one person should not be the part of more than one organs of the state one person should not form the part of more than one organs of the state it means that one person should be the part of only one organ of the state he should not join the other organ of the state in any way meaning thereby that the legislator should not become the executive the legislator should not be the part of the executive the members of parliament the members of legislature who are the elected representatives of the people they should not form the government it also means that the parliamentarians should not be the members of the council of ministers they should not become the ministers it would also mean that the members of the judiciary the judges should not form the executive they should not participate in the functioning of the government they should not also be the part of the legislator they should not be the parliamentarians they should not fight the elections they should not contest the elections this is the structural aspect of doctrine of separation of powers which was highlighted by bade and phillips this is the structural division of structural classification of the doctrine of separation of powers all the powers should be separated and one organ should not be the part of one organ should not form the part of more than one organ of the state one person should belong only to one organ of the state one organ of the government the legislator should not be the executive executive should not become the part of judiciary and judiciary the members of the judiciary should not be the part of executive and should not be the part of legislature the second proposition or the second meaning which was attributed to the doctrine of separation of powers by bade and phillips is that one organ of the government should not perform the functions and should not exercise the powers of the other organs of the state one organ of the state is not allowed to perform the functions of the other organ of the state one organ of the state is not permitted to exercise the powers of the other organ of the state it refers to the functional classification the functional division or the functional aspect of functional classification functional division of all the powers and functions of the state it refers to the functional aspect of the doctrine of separation of powers the third meaning which was given by bade and phillips to the doctrine of separation of powers is that one organ of the state should not interfere in the field of the other organ of the state one organ of the state should not interfere in the area of the other organ of the state it also refers to the functional aspect of doctrine of separation of powers it also refers to the functional division functional separation of powers and functions of different three organs of the state when bade and phillips say that one organ of the state should not interfere in the area of the other organ of the state it means that there should not be any kind of concept like judicial review meaning thereby that judiciary should not interfere in the field of the legislature and executive it means that 
there shall not be any kind of judicial review of legislative action, there shall not be any kind of judicial review of administrative action, there shall not be the authority with the parliament to enact such laws which may change the basis of the decisions given by the Supreme Court or the higher courts. There shall not be any kind of concept like responsible government, wherein the government is responsible to the elected house of the legislature or generally the government is responsible to the legislature. This is the meaning which was proposed by Bade and Phillips through three postulates, through three propositions, through three meanings. Number one, that one person should not be the part of more than one organs of the state. Number two, one organ of the state should not exercise the powers of the other organ of the state or one organ of the state should not perform the functions of the other organ of the state and number three that one organ of the state should not interfere in the area of the other organ of the state. These formulations proposed by Bade and Phillips prescribe for a structural as well as functional separation in powers and functions of different three organs of the state. If we apply this test suggested by Bade and Phillips, if we apply this meaning of doctrine of separation of powers suggested by Bade and Phillips, if we apply these propositions as to the meaning of separation of powers suggested by Bade and Phillips to examine the status of this doctrine of separation of powers in three jurisdictions UK, US and India, then we can very easily understand that how far this doctrine has been applied in these legal systems under their constitutional law. First of all, we will take up UK, the position of Britain. The status of doctrine of separation of powers in UK or in Britain, we can examine it by going through by observing the position of the king, parliamentary form of government, doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, position of the office of Lord Chancellor before 2005, status of the House of Lords before 2005, 2005 law reforms, the constitutional reform act 2005 and the establishment of Supreme Court of UK. If we see the position of king in England, it seems to be similar of the position of president in India with regard to its both powers or two kinds of powers the legislative powers and the executive powers. The king or the crown is the head of the executive. In addition to it, he is also part and parcel of the legislature. He is an important component of the legislature. He also forms the legislature and he also enjoys the judicial powers in some matters. So, three fold functions, three fold powers are being exercised by the king, by the crown. It seems to be the negation of the first formulation suggested by Wade and Phillips, that is the st structural aspect of the doctrine of separation of powers. Then, the parliamentary form of government seems itself to be the negation to these three postulates or particularly the first structural aspect of separation of powers where the elected members, the elected representatives, the members of the legislature, they form the, the, the house of commons, 
and house of lords they form the government or the council of ministers. So, when the legislators or parliamentarians they become the ministers or members of council of ministers and they form the government it is the negation to the structural aspect of separation of powers the parliamentary sovereignty principle itself seems to be the negation because all the two other organs of the state become subordinate to the parliament. If we see the status of or the position of the office of Lord Chancellor before 2005, the office of the Lord Chancellor was exercising three fold functions. It is the highest executive office in England. Lord Chancellor is also the part of House of Lords, is the member of House of Lords and he has also been given the judicial powers in some matters. So, he is also this office was also exercising three fold functions that was the negation to the doctrine of separation of powers. In England, the basic constitutional principles are the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty and therefore, it seems that there was no existence of the doctrine of separation of powers, but it is also important to note that without separating the powers of all the three organs of the state without decentralizing the powers of the government, we cannot make the rule of law sound. We cannot allow the rule of law to prevail if the powers and functions are concentrated in one organ or in one institution. That is the reason that in 2005 the British parliament enacted the constitution reform act 2005. This constitution reform act 2005 changed three important arrangements in UK. Number one, it established the supreme court of UK and by establishing the Supreme Court of UK, all the judicial powers, appellate judicial powers which were vested in House of Lords, that House of Lords was considered to be the superior most appellate court in England. In addition to being the upper house of the legislature. So, all the appellate judicial powers of House of Lords these were vested in the Supreme Court of UK and now the House of Lords has become simply a upper house like Indian Rajya Sabha or Indian Council of States. Number two, the 2005 Constitution Reform Act vested all the judicial powers of Lord Chancellor in the Supreme Court of UK. When this constitution reform act vested all the judicial powers of Lord Chancellor in Supreme Court of UK, it is also one step forward to separate the powers of the different three organs of the state. So, three major arrangements were made by the 2005 constitution reform act number 1 the establishment of the supreme court of uk number 2 wasting all the judicial powers of house of lords in this supreme court of uk and number 3 wasting all the judicial powers of office of lord chancellor in supreme court of uk the recommendations of donogore committee the recommendations of the committee on ministers powers which were appointed in 1929 to investigate into area of delegated legislation. These were also in favor of having the separation of powers to some extent in England when the Donogmore committee suggested that though the parliament is sovereign, but at the time of making the delegation of powers it must 
adopt the doctrine of self interest so that the essential legislative powers may not be delegated to the executive. This is the position of separation of powers in UK. If we see the position of separation of powers in US, the US constitution was the first ever constitution which gave the constitutional status to doctrine of separation of powers in express terms. The US constitution recognized the doctrine of separation of powers as the fundamental the basic constitutional principle and hold the structure of the American constitution is founded on the doctrine of separation of powers. If you see article 1, article 2 and article 3, the opening three articles, three opening articles of American constitution, the scheme of the doctrine of separation of powers has been ingrained in the constitution of America by these three opening articles, by these three opening provisions. Article 1, section 1 of American constitution states that all the legislative powers shall be vested in Congress. Article 2, section 1, it says that all the executive powers shall be vested in the President of US and Article 3, section 1 states that all the judicial powers shall be vested in the Supreme Court of US. The American constitution, the American legal system adopted the presidential form of the government, not the parliamentary form of the government because of the doctrine of separation of powers, where the executive is not responsible to the legislature. The independence of the Supreme Court of US also refers to the separation in the powers of all the three organs in particularly separation of judiciary from the executive. Despite the fact that American constitution recognized adopted the doctrine of separation of powers as the fundamental constitutional principle, it gave the constitutional status to this doctrine of separation of powers by separating the powers of all the three organs in first three opening provisions of the constitution, there are some exceptions. There is the overlapping of the functions of all the three organs in further provisions of the constitution. We can refer to the veto power of president, wherein the president can veto any legislative process being done by the congress this is the interference of the executive in the field of legislature. The president has the treaty making power and these treaties made by the president of US later on become the law when these get the approval of senate. So, the president of US also enjoying the legislative powers. This is the performance of the exercise of legislative powers, the performance of legislative functions by the executive. The president appoints the judges of the Supreme Court. So, it is the interference of the executive in matters of the judiciary. The legislature also interferes in the field of executive when the executive is given the authority to approve the appointments on some higher post which are made by the president these appointments cannot be functional unless these are approved by the senate. The treaties made by the president cannot become operative unless these are ratified by the senate. The appointments of the judges of the supreme court of US cannot become effective unless these are approved by the senate. So, this is the interference of the legislature in the field of the executive. Because of the doctrine of separation of powers, though in the original constitution of US, the judiciary, the Supreme Court of US did not have the power of judicial review, but in the later development, constitutional development in America, the judicial power of 
the Supreme Court has been recognized and now it is prevailing as the fundamental constitutional principle there in US. So, it is also the interference of the judiciary in the field of the executive and the legislature. This is the position of the separation of powers in US. Then it is also relevant to think about this overlapping of the functions of the three organs of the US in such a constitution wherein the doctrine of separation of powers was recognized as the basic constitutional principle such overlapping when we will find when we find it seems that the US constitution adopted the doctrine of checks and balances. So, that one organ of the state can check the other organ of the state to keep it within the limits of its own power. The arrangement has been made though the president has the veto power, but that veto exercised by the president can be made ineffective by the legislature by the congress if it by two third majority passes the resolution to this effect. So, such checks have been evolved in the US constitution. So, that one organ can check the other organ if the other organ transgresses its limits of the power. If we see the status of separation of powers in India, then we can say that in India the doctrine of separation of powers could not find its place or the constitutional status in express terms in our constitution except in article 50 under the part 4 the directive principles of state policy which are not enforceable which are only directives to the state. The renowned Indian legal scholar professor Upendra Vakshi says apart from the directive principles apart from the directive principle laid down in article 50 which enjoins the separation of judiciary from executive. The constitutional scheme does not embody any formalistic and dogmatic division of powers. The Supreme Court of India in the case of Ram Javaya versus state of Punjab which was decided in 1955 just after the commencement of Indian constitution highlights the status of doctrine of separation of powers in India. It is very important to see the observation made by the Supreme Court in this case to understand the real status of the separation of powers doctrine in Indian constitution. The Supreme Court observes Indian constitution has not indeed recognized the doctrine of separation of powers in its absolute rigidity, but the functions of the different parts or branches of government have sufficiently differentiated and consequently it can be very well said that our constitution does not contemplate assumption by one organ or part of the state of functions that essentially belong to another. It is very important to see carefully the last part of the observation made by the Supreme Court that our constitution does not contemplate assumption by one organ or part of the state of functions that essentially belong to another meaning thereby that one organ of the state is not allowed to perform or to inter to perform or to interfere in such functions of the other organ of the state which essentially belong to that organ. So, this is the status of separation of powers doctrine in Indian constitution in accordance with the opinion of the Supreme Court of India as expressed in Ram Javaya case. In this regard, the court interpreted two important provisions of Indian constitution article 73 and article 162. These two articles refers to the extent of the executive power of union and the extent of the executive power of 
state. The extent of executive power of union has been defined in article 73, whereas the extent of the executive power of a state has been specified in article 162. Article 73 says that the executive power of union extends to all those matters to which the legislature has the power to legislate the legislature has the power to make the law. It means that the executive can take any action on all those matters on which the legislature can make the law. The Supreme Court further clarifies that it is not essential, it is not necessary for the executive to wait for any legislation to be made by the legislature first and then only the executive can take the action. No, the executive can take the action on all those subject matters on which the parliament has authority to make the law and the Supreme Court says that the powers of the executive and the powers of the legislature under article 73 and 162 are mutually exclusive. The powers of the executive and legislature are mutually exclusive means that the powers of the executive are not dependent of the powers of the legislature. The mutual exclusiveness of the powers of the legislature and the executive was recognized by the Supreme Court under article 73 and 162. This also refers to, this also explains the status of separation of powers in India. In the illustrious case of Keswanand Bharti versus state of Kerala, which was decided in 1973 and which became the part of the constitutional history of India, when one check was, one restraint, one restriction was imposed over the authority of parliament to amend the constitution in the form of doctrine of basic structure. In this Keswanand Bharti case, the apex Indian court observed that separation of powers between legislature, executive and the judiciary is a part of basic structure of constitution. This structure cannot be destroyed by any form of amendment. So, this is the status of separation of powers as opined by the Supreme Court in Keswarand Bharti case. In the case of Indra Nehru versus Rajnarayan, Honorable Mr. Justice Beg had already opined that separation of powers is a part of basic structure of Indian constitution. None of the three organs of the republic can take over the functions assigned to the other. This scheme of the constitution cannot be changed even by resorting to article 368 of the constitution. There are some cases where the Supreme Court of India has also shown the great respect to the separation of powers doctrine, when it denied to entertain the policy matters and political questions by saying that, that policy matters essentially belong to the legislature or when it is the governmental policy or the executive policy belongs to the government and political questions cannot be subject of the judicial review by the court. We can refer to Tata Cellular versus Union of India decided in 1994. You all know that the decade of 90 was the decade of open economy, liberalization as to the economic policy of Indian government. On the other hand, that was also the decade of the introduction of new technology in India in the form of cellular phones, mobile phones. That was a decade wherein the cellular phones were introduced in India first ever. But at the time of introduction of cellular phones, there was no effective policy 
to regulate the use of those phones in India and therefore, a writ petition was filed before the Supreme Court to direct the legislature for the introduction of an effective policy for the use of cellular phones in India. But the Supreme Court denied to entertain the matter by observing that whether any law or any policy is to be laid down or not, this is the exclusive domain of parliament to decide. The court cannot interfere in such a matter, whether a law is to be enacted or not, whether a policy is to be laid down or not. This is the domain exclusive domain of parliament to determine and court cannot direct the legislature to lay down any particular policy or not to lay down any particular policy. The court cannot direct parliament or the legislature to enact a particular law or not to enact a particular law. What the court can do? The court can only examine or investigate any policy or any law laid down by the competent legislature on the question of validity. But whether it, it is to be made or not, this is the matter of legislative policy and it is not subject to judicial review. We can also refer to one more case decided by the Supreme Court. Beneath Narayan versus Union of India decided in 1996. This Beneath Narayan versus Union of India is also known as Hawala case. In this case, Mr. R. C. Sharma was appointed as the director of CBI. The procedure for the appointment of CBI director was challenged. The concerned High Court entertained the matter. When this matter reached to the Supreme Court of India, the Supreme Court showed a great displeasure in the way the High Court entertained the matter by saying that appointment procedure is an executive function and it belongs to the executive policy. Being the executive function, the executive or the government has the exclusive jurisdiction on that matter and the court cannot interfere. The court cannot tell the executive that what procedure should be there for the appointment on any post. The court can check the procedure laid down by the executive made by the executive only on the question of legality. What the procedure should be there? It is not the domain of the court to tell to the executive that this shall be the procedure for the appointment on any office. In the case of Mansukh Lal Das Chauhan versus state of Gujarat, there was the matter of the prosecution of a person under the Prevention of Corruption Act. In the Prevention of Corruption Act, the secretary was given the authority to sanction the prosecution. The High Court issued the writ of mandamus to the secretary to prosecute Mansukh Lal and the Supreme Court says that this was not correct to interfere in the matter because it is the matter of subjective satisfaction of the secretary to prosecute or not to prosecute any person. The Supreme Court held that the secretary must form its own subjective opinion whether to prosecute any person or not. And therefore, again the Supreme Court showed the great respect to the doctrine of separation of powers and to deny to entertain the matter by saying that, that this matter belongs to the executive and it is the matter of subjective satisfaction of the secretary whether to prosecute any person or not. One more important case we can refer in this regard and I, as I discussed the scenario of the decade of 90s wherein 
the era of globalization, liberalization started, privatization also. The Indian government changed its policy regarding the investment in public sectors. The policy of disinvestment was introduced. Balco Employees Union versus Union of India, the case was decided in 2002. The Supreme Court says that policy decision of the government and political questions are not fit for judicial review because it belongs to the executive policy and the government is always free to change its policy in accordance with the need of time. The Supreme Court cannot interfere in these policy matters. This is the status of, of separation of powers in India though the co Indian constitution could not give the constitutional status in express terms or in the form of express provisions of Indian constitution. But if we see all these developments or interpretations by the Supreme Court of India, we can say very well that the separation of powers in India is functional. It is found in its functional aspect in Indian constitution. Still there are personal and functional overlappings in India also. Supreme Court has the power of judicial review, parliamentary form of government is there, law making power of president of India, there is the pardoning power of the president, judicial powers of legislature in matters of breach of privileges, in matters of impeachment of president and removal of the judges. Powers of the government cannot be then we can justify this overlapping with reference to the doctrine of checks and balances that the powers of the government cannot be put in watertight compartments. The government cannot run effectively without interaction, coordination and cooperation of all the three organs of the government. Application of separation of powers in its rigidity will create absolute independence to all the three organs. Logic behind the separation of powers is divergence rather than a strict arrangement or a strict classification. Professor Wade says that objection of Montesquieu was against the concentration and domination and not against any kind of interaction in different three organs of the state. The doctrine cannot be applied in its classical or rigid sense. The mutual checks in the exercise of powers by different organs of the government seems to be the workable form of separation of powers. This theory of mutual control is the soul of the doctrine of separation of powers. Thus, the doctrine can be better cherished in its pragmatic form of checks and balances. In this sense, the administrative process cannot be said to be antithesis of separation of powers. We can conclude our today's discussion by referring one important case decided by the Supreme Court and the doctrine of separation of powers can better be understood in the light of the observation made by Honorable Mr. Justice Chandrachur in the case of Indra Nehru versus Raj Narayan. He says that the political usefulness of doctrine of separation of powers is now widely recognized. No constitution can survive without a conscious adherence to its fine checks and balances just as courts ought not to enter into problems untwinded with political tickets, parliament must also respect the preserve of the court. The principle of separation of powers is the principle of mutual restraint and therefore, we can say that the doctrine of separation of powers can be appreciated only in the form of checks and balances. The pragmatic form, the workable form of separation of powers is the doctrine of checks and balances, it can never be applied in the in its rigid or classical form. In no constitution of the world, the doctrine of separation of powers could be applied in its strict rigid and classical meaning, strict rigid and classical sense even in American constitution, wherein it has been recognized as the basic or fundamental constitutional principle, it could not be applied in its rigid or classical sense. So, the pragmatic and workable form of the separation of powers is the doctrine of checks and balances. 
and it can be applied in any democratic constitution only in the same form. So, that is all we will discuss the next topic in the next, next lecture. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gillette Sam uh, and I teach sociology at uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, today I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what sociology is. Um, in order to uh, go ahead and study sociology, one of the things you need to develop is a sociological way of thinking. Uh, now this capacity to think in a sociological manner was termed as the sociological imagination by an American sociologist called C. Wright Mills in 1959. He argued that uh, in order to think in a sociological manner, you should be able to have uh, two different skill sets. The first skill set uh, would require you to have the capacity to think beyond uh, the problems that individuals face. So if you encounter a problem that someone, some one individual is facing, you should be able to connect it to a broader public problem. Uh, Mills gave the example of, uh, you know, people in his neighborhood. He says, if uh, there is one person who is unemployed in the neighborhood, that seems to be an individual problem. But as a sociologist, you're expected to dig around a little. So you come across a couple of other people in your neighborhood who are also unemployed. Uh, that indicates to you that rather than being a specific problem, there is a larger public issue at hand. So as a sociologist, you are supposed to, come by, uh, to look at individual problems and see how they are connected to broader public issues. Uh, the second uh, capacity that uh, you are expected to develop as a sociologist is the capacity to link uh, an individual's biography with history. Uh, historical thought may not come to you as the first thing that is connected to sociology, but it plays a pretty important role in the field. Uh, so Mills argues that uh, rather than looking at a problem in the here and now, it is important to trace that long historical trajectory that may be connected to this individual problem. Let me give you an example uh, from India. right? Um, Let's say uh, you look at uh, the women in your family. Uh, let's f let's see at what age do they get married. So uh, you may see that your sibling is getting married at the age of 25. Uh, go back one generation. At what age did your mother get married? You may find that she got married a little younger, let's say 21. Go back another generation. At what age did your grandmother get married? You may find that she got married even younger, uh, 18 or possibly even younger than that. So this capacity to see how the history of a family then influences the age at which your sibling got married, that is the capacity to bridge uh, the biography of a person or rather by bio biography we can also think of uh, the biography of a particular problem with history, what has happened in the past, how is that connected to this individual or this problem in the present. Thank you.